So have, have you noticed that since the pandemic or since the quarantine, that guests are different, maybe a different type of person coming into the church, a different number is kind of curious there. Well, let's go back a full decade and let's look at how guests were personality wise, what what they did, how they what their habits were and how the church is responding. Let's go back 10 years ago and let's compare it today. This is going to be a fascinating episode. Welcome to Rainer on Leadership. I'm Tom Rainer. I'm joined by Sam Rainer. And as always, we want to thank our sponsor, Lagos Faith Life. According to a recent survey, 30% of evangelical churchgoers want more in-depth teaching. If you want to go deeper in the word, Lagos is the Bible study platform for you. And that could be emphasized again and again. If you don't have Lagos, you need Lagos. It fuses, Lagos fuses powerful technology with biblical resources. So you can access Bibles, search tools, commentaries, seminary level courses, audio books right on your phone. Over 200,000 digital books from the world's top publishers. Incredible. And it's really affordable. Logos is now more affordable. You can get started for just $49. Go to logos.com slash church answers or look in the show notes and click on there. Okay, Sam, so I'm going to open this by talking about the difference in guests, their behavior, uh, who is coming, who is not coming uh, post quarantine, but fascinating to go back deeper into time and to go back a decade ago and to see how things are changing in terms of guests. And uh, what you've done in this particular uh, podcast is you've created the content. You looked at the front door, the back door. You looked at some technology. You really looked at some valuable information on drive, to uh, drive times. And then you said, hey, there's some things that have not changed. and We need to look at that. So we're going to get into each of those five points Let's talk about the front door, Sam. Why is it different today than 10 years ago? Uh, it's the, the digital world. Um, it's the the expectation of um, being able to find you easily uh, on the internets before you even consider going to the campus. Um, 10 years ago, uh, you would your your true first impression was the parking lot and then walking into the door and the first person you meet and the greeters. Um, you know, you're talking, you know, 2010, 2012 uh, streaming was just kind of in its infancy. Not many people were streaming many things at all. Um, so this idea that I'm going to go to the website and check out a service before I even go to a service that didn't exist 10 years ago. Uh, but it exists now. And so people are checking out your YouTube page. You're looking at your services, your sermons. Um, they're obviously there. <laughs> some some churches uh, have even done like a walk around on their campus in Google. You can, you know, do the um, do the pictures on Google and you can even see the worship space like like you're in it. Um, so I would say the big difference with the front door is that first impressions are now made digitally. So what that means is we can see more people come to our church if we have good digital first impressions. Well, we can also see more people decide not to come by bad digital impressions. The classic one used to be if you go to the website and there's not an address or a service time that they go to the next one. But now there's a lot more to it digitally. Yeah. I mean, one of the more common searches is churches near me and it pops up. Or uh, churches in Bradenton, Florida, and it pops up. So if you have not done your work digitally, the Googles are not drawing in your information. So you're not high in those rankings. And this is absolutely critical. Um, you know, we've talked about this before, and I know I've mentioned it many times. If you haven't claimed your digital address, you need to go claim it. Because that's how you can control what people see. So okay, what does that mean? All right, I'm I'm a listener. If you had not claimed your digital address, what does that mean? Does that mean I'm going to go get a pickaxe and I'm going to go uh, dig somewhere and I hope that a digital address is going to show up, whatever that is? Somewhat. I mean, there's some truth to that. You don't need a pickaxe. Um, but um, so our at our church address at West Bradenton is 1305 43rd Street West. So when I type in West Bradenton Baptist Church, 
the, the address is going to be part of the Google search. Google Maps is incorporated into the Google searches now. And they're off to the side at, at the time of this recording. It's right there on the right. Um, you'll see a little link that says, are you the business owner? And if, if you have not gone through the process of making yourself the business owner of that address, you're one, you're really exposing yourself to somebody claiming it and you don't want that. Um, but when you, when you become the business owner of that address per Google, by the way, it's free. You don't have to, they don't charge you anything for this. That they, they have a, you come up. Yeah. The, you'll go through the process. They'll walk you through it. Uh, the, when I did it, there was a snail, there was actually a piece of mail that they sent. Ironically, they sent you snail mail. And then, you know, that's how they you prove that you're at that address. Um, but what it does is it enables you to interact with the reviews. Um, it enables you to update your times. It, a lot of times people aren't even looking for service times on the web page. They just look at it on Google. Um, mm. So are you open? That's on Google. Um, and it, it, there's lots, you can upload your own pictures so that you make sure that some of the first impressions that people see are the, anyone can take a picture and tag it to your address, whether you own the address or not. Um, but you, if you upload your own pictures, they are more likely to be at the top of search results. So the image that you portray in the community, one, you want to be honest about it, but you want to control that. You don't want other people to control that. And if you have not claimed your digital address, what you are in essence saying is I'm going to let whoever just be the first impression of my church. Or I'm going to let Google be the first impression of my church. And um, as much as I like Google, they, they don't care about your church. So you need to make sure that, uh, that you're doing the right thing and making a good first impression digitally. The second point, I need you to flesh this one out. The back door is different, less consumerism, but also less frequency. I know what you're talking about with less frequency. You're talking about the fact that even some of our more faithful members that used to come four times a month are now coming three times. And some of our somewhat faithful members that used to come three times a month are now coming two. And we can continue that off to there once a month and then once a quarter. But what do you mean by less consumerism as it, it as it, it talks about the back door, what what's the connection between back door and consumerism? Well, you've likely lost all your consumers <laughs> through the pandemic. Is what I'm saying. Got it. <laughs> so, uh, you know, the most churches, and I, I say 99 percent of churches are smaller on the other side of the pandemic. We don't know exactly that's, but that's a pretty good guess on our part, anecdotal. I I, I, th I think it is a very good number. It is an extremely rare thing to see a church that is larger on the other side of the pandemic. Out of the hundreds and hundreds and maybe a few thousand churches that I've had connections with, say, since uh, middle of 2021 forward, I probably can think of two or three, if that many, that yeah. are actually larger in attendance. And the larger the church, the more likely they are on a percentage basis, even smaller. Um, than say a, a smaller church, which on a percentage basis didn't lose as many people per, percentage wise. Um, so when I mean when I'm saying less consumers, um, <laughs> there's still there's still people out there who are going to treat the church that way. Um, but you're you're less you have fewer people, but the core is stronger than ever. Um, and unfortunately, it's even though the core is stronger than ever, meaning they're bought into the mission and vision of the church. They aren't coming as often. Uh, so there is kind of a double-edged sword here. That's probably not the right analogy, but you're not, you've already lost people that you're going to lose that were on the fringe, that were there just because they were consuming things. Um, but the people that you have are not coming as often. Let's talk about this third point on follow-up. Text is now accepted, but you can stand out with handwritten notes. I would say, again, Totally anecdotal, maybe closer to guesswork than anecdotal. Maybe I need to even distance it from anecdotal. I would say 95% of churches do not have any kind of text follow-up. Yeah, that that's not good. Um, so here's what I mean by this. If it's 2010, 2012, uh, and you're texting a guest, they are creeped out. I mean, th th that they are creeped out. Um, they, they're even asking the question, how did you know this was my cell phone number? Well, now everybody gives you, you know, if they're going to give you a number, it's their 
It's their cell phone number. So they've, they've put the number in some type of guest information somewhere. Is that yeah, what you're t- t- 10 years ago, if you gave somebody your number at a church, you're expecting a phone call. Right. Now, particularly if it's a younger person, text is much more accepted. I still think you need to follow up with a phone call. If a guest gives you a number, don't just text, but uh, you need to call them and hear them out and all of that. But the weirdness of it's Sunday afternoon and you get a text, hey, thanks for visiting West Braden and Baptist Church. Um, click here for more information or whatever, whatever form text you want to send out. Um, that's not as creepy. In fact, most people kind of expect it. Um, but I still think you should give them a call. And I, I usually try to call. I find that Tuesday afternoons, you know, kind of after school pickup are a good time to, to call people. I don't know why that is, but I just find people pick up more. If they don't pick up, I leave a voicemail. Um, so follow up via text is now, I won't say expected, but it is accepted if I said my terms correctly. I, you can challenge me on this if you want to. But I would say you would be in the top 0.1%. That's one out of every 1,000 of churches if you follow up with any kind of handwritten note. Yeah, every guest. Yeah, every guest at West Bradenton gets a, it's a, there's some, it's typed up and it's a form letter, but I write in that form letter handwritten notes. I do that on every single one. Um, and sometimes it's very simple, but if I met the person, they're getting that form letter that has all the information that we want them to know about our church. Here's where to find all the stuff that you're looking for. But I'm writing off to the side, hey, thanks for you know introducing yourself after the service. Um, you know, it was great to meet you and and um, your son. Um, I hope he enjoyed the student ministry. I'm glad he got to meet uh, Pastor Devon, blah, 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 blah. So I'll write all that out. Um, on the form letter. Now, it may be better if I if they just got a little card from me and it was just a handwritten note, um, but that's how we do things right now. And I still will write handwritten notes with just a card from me. Um, the point here is it's way more memorable. Now, I mean, a text is fine and I think people will appreciate that. But if you write a handwritten note, you are really standing out today. No, big change, big change in its drive time. It used to be for a lot of churchgoers, 20 minutes was not that bad. 25 minutes was not that bad. Sometimes even 30 or 45 minutes, particularly if you were driving to a large regional church. We are seeing, and you have been noting this even pre-pandemic, we are seeing the renaissance or the potential renaissance of the neighborhood church. And one of the reasons is people want to be in something where their community is. Many of them are working in their homes now and not commuting somewhere, but the community is becoming more important. So neighborhood churches are becoming more desirable. Therefore, these guests, at, as, as a rule, are driving a shorter time than they used to. Yes. And um, it's my new book. And you know who just sent me an email like while we were recording? It's funny that this comes up. Uh, Tyndale, Tyndale, our publisher. Yes. Yeah. And they've got the title and the subtitle of my book finalized. You want to hear it? Yes. The Surprising Return of the Neighborhood Church. Discover how your church is primed to reach your neighbors. Ooh, that couldn't be any better. That is incredible. So at the time of this recording, we're still in the editing phase, but it will be coming out soon. I mean, just to hear that name of that book, man. Well, uh, by, by, by the time this this particular podcast releases, uh, we will have a new website, uh, a store. We'll have a new store, I should say. And uh, I can't wait till we start putting books like that at the store. That's going to be fun. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm pretty excited about you know the the store at Church Answers. Yep, got a got a good book bookstore there. Go check it out. Yep, it's going to be good. A lot of other things at that store, but that's for another time. Okay, I was at your church not too long ago. I went to hear you yes. preach. You didn't. I mean, I tried to. to- <laughs> it was that bad. You don't. You're not even going to call it preaching. I no, you didn't preach. <laughs> I wasn't in the pulpit. You weren't in the pulpit. So uh, 
I spend more time in Tennessee than I do in Bradenton. So naturally, I hear your younger brother preach in person more than I hear you. And I go to your church and there's a guest preacher. Now, he did a wonderful job. He's a good man. Hey, that's fine. But I wanted to hear you preach. And you should have seen the look on your mother's face when I said, Sam's not preaching. She said, why? Why? He's got a guest preacher. (laughs) But in the midst of this, I saw someone, and I'm almost sure it was taking place, holding up a document and putting a phone to it. And I think that they were doing a QR code. I I couldn't get close enough, but I think they were doing a QR code in your church. Yes, we use QR QR codes for giving. We use QR codes for guests. Um, We even use QR codes at our membership class uh, to point people to certain things. So, Hey, if you want to download the bylaw, bylaws, Definitely use this QR code. Um, and, and QR, believe it or not, QR codes 10 years ago was kind of a new thing. Like it was kind of a, uh, a happening sort of technology. Slow and adoption. They, well, but it phased out and then the, the pandemic occurred and everyone stopped printing a lot of stuff and they started using QR codes more. So th- this is kind of unique in that if you rewind 10 years, 12 years, you're going to, your QR codes were a thing and people were all excited about this technology. And then they completely just kind of phased out and now they're back again. Right. Um, so we actually have, uh, we have paper uh, for, for guests to, you know, fill out um, little cards in the pews but on that paper is a QR code. So they can they can use it pen and paper or they can use the QR code. Um, so we give people the option. And I think that's a good way to go about it um, because some people just aren't going to do the QR code. And then some people just aren't touching that piece of paper. Um, so we, we do both. The QR code is on the paper and it's scannable in the pew. Hey, did you know that your mother and I go out to eat frequently? I'm shocked that you guys don't cook. Well, we don't, we don't. And I should say, if I wanted to, if I want to eat, I'll go out. There's, there's food, but there's not prepared meals um, at the house. I'm trying to think of the last one, but that would be naughty of me to try to recall that many years ago. So we don't, we don't, we don't have prepared (laughs) meals at the house. So when we want a good meal, we'll do one of two things. We'll go to a restaurant or We'll have him deliver from a restaurant or a third. We'll pick up at a restaurant, one of those three. And we do all three of them almost in equal amounts. So um, now when I go into a restaurant, usually on the door or somewhere near, there's a QR code for the menu. And I just click onto it. And the server will come and bring the menu. And I'll say, I don't need one. I've already picked out what I want. And your mom will look at me and she'll say, what, did you go online before you came here? I said, no, I just used the QR code and downloaded the menu and looked at it real quickly. And she she's just saying, why can't you just look at the menu? I said, well, I did. Never mind. So <laughs> I, I, I use the QR code probably twice a week now. And most of the time it is related to going out to eat somewhere. Yep. Uh, I encourage you. Uh, QR codes are very easy to create. You can Google it and find all sorts of instructions how to create QR you used to have people to code QR codes. It's a different world now. Yeah. I mean, they've got automated, coder. they've got free and automated systems. It's not that challenging at all. And they, they work very well. Um, now the technology has improved quite dramatically from where it was 10 years ago. So they phased out. Now they're back again and you can uh, use them to your benefit in the church. So, now there's something that hasn't yeah, changed. I want to hear, and we've I want to talked talk about, about all these things that have changed. We've been looking at QR codes. We've been looking at drive time. We've been looking at text and handwritten letters. We've been looking at the back door and the front door. And there's a lot of change there, but something that has not. What is it? Well, most people come to your church because somebody invited them. Uh, right. That has not changed. If you poll your guests and you ask, why are you here? Um, it, it's, <laughs> you will hear some say, well, I found you online, you know, or I liked what I saw online. Um, but most of them are going to say, well, so-and-so invited me. Um, I don't have a hard stat, but my, uh, guess from just all the research that we do at church answers would be 80%. I would think 80% oh, of people are well. in, in a church, eight out of 10, four out of five, are there because our 16 somebody, out of 20 or 
Yeah, well, however you want to do the fraction. Um, the other thing to 40. note. Yes, all all true. Um, the other thing to note is that of people that are in your church in person on a Sunday morning or whenever you have worship service, um, two to five percent of them will identify as a guest. So keep that in mind. You likely have more guests than you realize, at least in their perspective. You may think that person's been here four times. Well, they may have been, but they they still may consider themselves a guest. So there is probably more guests than you realize, and that's a positive thing. So use some of these tips to assimilate them. Uh, in the body. It's good information. Speaking of good information, the font of good information, books, other resources is Tyndale Publishing House. They're our sponsor and you are going to talk about a feature book by Tyndale. It's, this, is, this is a really good one. Confessions of a French Atheist by Guillaume Bignon. Um, and this is the second time that we've talked about um, Guillaume and uh, I hope I'm pronouncing his name right, um, and I'm probably Americanizing it. So those of you who are in our North American audience, uh, well, there's some Canadians who speak French, so um, I'm probably not getting the name exactly right, but uh, it's memorable, which is good. He's a French atheist, was, was a French atheist who grew up in a country that had little use for God, and he had no earthly reason to follow Jesus, but God himself was at work when Guillaume decided to prove that Christianity was wrong to his girlfriend a woman he'd met seemingly by chance on vacation in the Caribbean. And the result was this. Today, Dr. Guillaume Bignon is a dedicated Christian theologian, a well-respected apologist, and a frequent guest on radio and in-person debates with atheists. Uh, after his improbable conversion from atheism to Christianity, he earned a master's in biblical literature and a PhD in philosophical theology. His conversion story has attracted more than 300,000 views on YouTube and his new book, which I encourage all of you to go get and read, Confessions of a Freight French Atheist, that released this summer. You can find the link in the show notes. Go get this book. Thank you, Tyndale, for making us aware of it. Thank you, Tyndale, for uh, telling our audience about it. Confessions of a French Atheist by Guillaume. Hey, Guillaume. before you sign out, Sam, I mentioned this in a previous podcast, but I just want to mention it one more time. At our sister podcast, EST, you did a great interview uh, with Church Growth Services. And I, I, I might want to make sure that we're going to point many of our folks there about how generosity and how stewardship and how fundraising, which is the more common vernacular, can be done in a smaller church. So great interview there. Yeah, the title of the particular podcast is The Connection Between uh, Stewardship, Generosity, and Discipleship. And I'm just saying that off the tip. I don't have those notes in front of me, but you can go find it. Churchanswers.com is a great place to go to find these kinds of resources. There are so many free things at churchanswers.com. We provide these podcasts, webinars, articles. Um, obviously, there's things that uh, we have for sale. We'd love for people to purchase anything, but um, you can also find tons of free stuff. So thank you, audience, uh, for tuning in to Rainer on Leadership. And thank you, everyone who visits Church Answers to read and consume our resources. We're always glad to help you churches that are out there to grow healthy together. <laughs>